G'day everyone, welcome to Monetize Your Mission. I'm your host, Rita Joyan, and today I've got an extremely special guest in because you've probably realized that throughout this whole interview series, I've interviewed experts who have a global presence. And here's a person, a special lady by the name of Amanda Whitley, who has an, a significant presence, but very niched in the local area of Canberra, Australia. And Amanda is the force behind Her Canberra, an online publication that talks everything about recipes to nutrition to exercise, anything to do with the gals, it's in Her Canberra. And it's all about how to get women involved and connected in the community that is Canberra. And she's the, really the mastermind behind it that has allowed people to come together in an online world, but to be secure in a small community. But I wanted to let Amanda explain more about it. So Amanda, welcome to Monetize Your Mission. Thank you so much, Rita. Now, your story is really interesting and I have heard some rumors about it, but I'd love for you to explain an online publication. How did it all come about and why Canberra? Uh, look, I guess there was, it was a combination of a few things, but it really was crystallised when my youngest daughter was born very prematurely. So she, I had been a very successful public servant uh, in government, so I'd been a director of communications for probably six or seven years before um, I had children. And I ended up, I was pregnant with my second child and had to go in on bed rest at 25 weeks pregnant. So I stayed there until she was born at 30 weeks. And when she was born, she stayed in hospital for another 10 weeks after that. And when she got out, she was very sick. She had chronic lung disease. So the doctors basically said, look, she can't go to childcare for two years, which meant I couldn't work for two years which kind of did my head in a little bit because um, I'd always been very career-driven and, you know, it was, I've always really loved work. Um, so I found myself very isolated. You know, a lot of my social network was in the workplace. And so I found myself at home with two little ones and I guess, you know, really needed social and intellectual stimulation. And I wasn't getting that because I couldn't really go anywhere. So... Uh, I found, I guess, I stumbled across um, a very small then blog called Mamma Mia, which is now huge. Um, but back then it was very small and just starting out, and there were probably only about 30 regular commenters, and I struck up friendship with them and eventually struck up a friendship with Mia Friedman, who, who made the site. And so after about six months of, um, of communication, she asked me and another couple of regular commenters if we'd be interested in helping her to build the site. So my job was, among other things, to moderate all the comments on the site. And if any of the people listening have ever been on Mamma Mia, it's a very feisty kind of environment. So I did that for about a year, which was a great experience, but um, a year of moderating quite uh, feisty comments um, takes it out of you. So I wanted to step back and get back into real life and at that point realised that I couldn't find anything online and about my local community for, for people of my demographic. And so, you know, I guess this idea started to grow you know, maybe I should make something. Maybe I should get some of the local women that are out there who are experts in their field, so in things like nutrition and fashion and all those sorts of things, together and maybe we should make a site that's all about connecting people with their own city and so that's kind of how it started and so that's really interesting was it something writing something that you had an interest in was it a passion yeah so look i i did my bachelor of arts degree in communication i wanted I, I knew that i wanted to do something to do with writing from the time i was really young i published my first magazine called Wombat when I was 11. Um, look, I, I grew up in the country, so my public school was 42 kids and then my high school was, was 400. So I don't think that I really had a concept of all the career options that there were out there. 
I knew I wanted to do something with writing. I thought it was journalism. But then when I went to uni, I discovered that there was this thing called PR, which for me, I have a very short attention span. So for me, you know, this was a chance for me to do things, all the things I loved. So writing and organising events and being creative. And so that's kind of what I did for, um, you know, the next 15, 20 years. And I still do elements of that. Writing to me, I think, is it's a big part of what we do, but, you know, there's so much more to being a business person. Um, and, you know, that, that appeals to me as someone who has a need for variety. I don't know that I'd be happy if I was just writing day in, day out. Fair enough, fair enough. And so really the way that this all has come about is well, there was a necessity for you to do something because you were at home, you were a mum, you needed some stimulation, some challenge. And that then came around, well, I love the skill of writing and you were involved in the Mamma Mia process and the publication. And then you started your own. What possessed you? Like, because if someone's sitting there thinking, well, I'd like to start something, what made you feel that I could actually... Because a lot of women ask me, I don't know if I'm good enough to do something like that. How did you overcome that if you had that hurdle at all of what, what, I, what would I, could I contribute to all of this? Look, for me, I guess, uh, as you say, there was a need. So for me, I always come back to, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And I think there was a fairly immediate response to when I started Her Canberra for people going, oh, this is a great idea. My challenge was that, you know, I was not a business person. I'd never had any desire to be an entrepreneur or a business person. I'd always had a very nice, reliable salary. Um, when I was, when after Sophia was born, you know, I, I had, um, I did little bits and pieces enough to kind of, you know, pay for groceries and that sort of thing. But um, when I had the idea for her Canberra, I actually, because I know my personality and I'm quite impetuous, I sort of, I thought, oh, I'll let this idea sort of stew and I'll see if it goes away. Um, and it didn't and it kept getting bigger and bigger. So I actually did a very un like thing and wrote a, quite a half ass business plan, which was really, you know, two, two A4 pages. And I took my husband out to dinner and I said, I've got an idea. And, you know, it, it had things like what, would we focus on what the target audience would be, how we would monetize this thing eventually. Um, and, you know, looking back on it five years, um, it's, it's quite amazing how true we've stayed to that. So I guess, look, I don't think I ever had a moment of, you know, am I good enough? Because I just kind of thought, well, if I need this, then surely other people will. But... For me, the discipline was in thinking as a business person. And for me, the main thing was, and I think this is the secret to success of any online business, is consistency. And, you know, I made a deal with myself in that first business plan that we would post two to three articles every weekday, which anyone who does a blog knows that that's a huge commitment. Even, you know, we went overseas a year after I started it. So I scheduled four weeks of posts in advance ready to go. And this is before I had staff, you know. So I think the whole struggling with value and worth probably came a little bit later when my personality is to want to give people things or do things for people. And it really was a big lesson for me to learn to actually put a dollar value to what I did. Wow. So then, so that's interesting because as an employee, you get a set salary. This is what you're worth. This is what I'm going to do for the, the, the role that I'm entitled to. And you do that. So what was the hiccup and how did you overcome? Because that's a huge thing. How do you charge for what you're worth and charge to the standard, not below? Yeah, it's, look, and it's really hard. I think when you come out of a public sector environment, you don't really have any idea how much you should be charging. And for me, you know, it's been a very incremental kind of, of rise. And I think in the early days, you obviously go in very low just because you want to get clients and, and that sort of thing. Um, and it actually was external people saying to me, you're not charging enough. You need to charge more. 
once we got to a point where we, you know, we did have a good solid um, audience. I mean, so these days we have around 90,000 unique readers a month. Probably once we hit sort of the 50,000 mark, um, you know, people said, you really need to be charging more. And I was like, ooh, I don't know. But it, it kind of gets to that point where you go, well, look, I'm just going to put it out there and see what happens. And there's that kind of surprise when people don't hesitate and you're like, oh, you're happy to pay them? Okay, <laughs> sure. Um, and I think then, you know, once you get to a point where you are getting very regular business, um, you have the confidence then. And I think the confidence to not, the confidence to say no to things, um, no to things if they're not right, and also perhaps, you know, really price things for what they're worth um, and not be upset if people don't say yes. Mm. You know yeah. what I mean? Absolutely, absolutely. And then that's rings so true because uh, there is that tug of war in the beginning. Do I, do I not, and how much do I charge? And then once you finally did, which is huge, what do cha what mount what channels of monetization does her Canberra currently have? So we have, I guess our brand is, is continuing to expand. So we have the website, but we also now have a quarterly magazine, which we've been running for a year. Um, we have an event series and we've also just introduced a podcast series. So in terms of the website, there are a few different avenues. So we have uh, display banners on the website that people can, mm -hmm. can buy, which are obviously the most, you know, the easiest kind of, you know, just it's simple display. We have a sponsored editorial and we really, we really, really try hard to make that editorial not advertorial because I don't think that that is something that um, promotes readers wanting to engage and I don't think it's necessarily particularly helpful for the businesses that we work with either. So I think coming from a PR background, I like to understand what the clients are wanting to do and the budget that they have to work with, which is very unfashionable to want to talk about. <laughs> but it's really helpful for us to know. Um, and then develop a solution for them. So not just kind of like, here's our menu, pick something and we'll do it. We really say, look, what is it you want to achieve? We think that this is going to work for you. It's so um, a consultative approach. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of, it's almost like a, I guess her camera is almost like a, a media, outlet, media outlet slash marketing consultancy. And that just comes from my background. And, you know, I think we're, with solutions oriented rather than transaction oriented. Mm -hmm. We also have social media, which we do. Um, and, you know, our social media network's now close to 50,000. So we like to do that as a value add, but also as a, you know, we do it as a product, but only if it's something that's uh, interrelated to the content on the website. We won't just put anyone, slap anyone's ad on our Instagram. Because, again, it's about wanting to build that loyalty and engagement with our audience. Mm -hmm. And then we have the magazine, which magazine ads. We offer all of these as a package if people want to buy them all as a package. Um, we've got our events, which really are primarily designed to try and get people to, to meet new people in Canberra because there's a massive issue in Canberra with people finding it really, really hard to meet people. Yeah. So we do that. But there's also, we found increasingly there's an interest from our clients in hosting these events because it makes sense for them if we can bring a captive audience into their space to their theatre event or to their exhibition or whatever event it is and we can give them a good experience at the same time, it's, um, it's just smart business sense, I think. Mm. That's excellent. That's really excellent. And I think so those various ways of events and advertising and social media are the ways that you're bringing it in, yep. in monetization. And you've been doing her cat well, you've been publish well, publishing her camera for five years now. That's correct. Yeah. Awesome. So tell me this, Amanda, and I know that when a lot of public servants come to me and say, I want out, I don't know what I want to do, but I know I want out. 
the mindset that goes from being an employee to becoming an entrepreneur, you know, you're paid a salary, which we said before, but an entrepreneur, you're being paid to add value. Mm. And those are the distinctions. What was it for you that allowed you to go from an employee mentality and transition into, and what we covered that briefly before saying your value and how much to charge, but was there anything else that you had to get your head around other outside the money to be able to equip yourself to stride in the steps of an entrepreneur? Look, I probably wasn't a very typical public servant. <laughs> um, and look, I think it's, it's probably important to say that I didn't leave the public service out of choice, you know. It was something that was kind of thrust upon me. And I actually did go back part-time for 18 months while I was building the site up because, you know, there's that tricky money thing that you need. Um, but I guess I was always someone that was always trying to push the boundaries and the thing that frustrated me about the public service was that nothing happened quick enough for me. So I think, you know, my personality traits, looking back, you know, it's far better suited to an entrepreneurial environment where I can go, I've got an idea and people go, great, let's do it. Not sort of like, well, look, why don't you write a minute and we'll send it up and, you know, all of that. So, look, you know, I think the personality traits that I had were, were well suited. As I sort of, for me, the things that I really had to work very hard at and still have to work very hard at are those business essentials, you know, thinking about money and, you know, cash flow was a massive eye-opener for me. You know, there were some weeks where I'm like, oh, my God, I've got all this money. And then other weeks I'm like, oh, my God, I don't actually think I can pay for bread this week. You know, all those things that you learn as you build your business and, um, I am not naturally particularly good with maths and accounting and, you know, they make my head hurt. But they've, you know, they're so important. You need to know your numbers and you need to be on top of your finances, particularly when you start to employ people because it's not just your groceries that you've got to worry about. Mm. And that was a, a very, very scary step, um, going to employ my first staff member. We've now got five, six of us. Um, and you know, and I think, you know, as the, the business grows and as that cash flow becomes, uh, more reliable, um, that concern eases slightly, but it's always there. And I think that's what keeps you hungry. Mm, you, know, yeah. you have to work hard to make sure that these people that have trusted you, um, continue to be able to have a, a, a good life as well. Bread in their pantry. <laughs> Absolutely. <Yeah. laughs> so because the business has grown and the publication has grown and your subscriber reach has expanded, how are you currently managing, Amanda, because I know it's not an easy thing, the business, you know, having some time for yourself in order to, to take care of yourself and the kids? Because how old are the girls now? They're seven and nine. So, so they need attention. I mean, they always need attention, but they still need attention. They still need mummy time. How are you working? How are you balancing? Or is there such a thing as balancing in your world? Balance is probably not a strong word. <laughs> it's probably too strong a word. Look, I, this year I actually feel very calm and, and kind of feel like everything's together. Um, last year I, I certainly wasn't and I think my body reached a point where it was like had enough. But I recently wrote an article about basically realising that I couldn't be superwoman. So I was trying to be everything to everyone. I was trying to be the business owner. I was trying to, you know, I was working 12-hour days. Plus, I was still trying to pick my kids up from school every day and ferry them to swimming and dance and everything else. I was volunteering at the school. I was a board member on the preschool. All these things, you know, it's like, yes, I can do it all until I couldn't anymore. So I just, I realised that I just needed to ask for help. And so I now have a, a friend, friend I went to school with actually, her daughter now picks my girls up from school two days a week and takes them to their various things. Um, I have a cleaner, which is the best thing I ever <laughs> High five to that. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, and look, and I just sort of, I think... I learned to delegate more as well. I now I have an awesome team of people who I trust. They they love 
the organisation as much as I do. They understand the brand. I trust them to make decisions. I don't need to micromanage, nor do I want to micromanage. And I just realised that I could keep going this way, but it was kind of, it was taking away from the reason that I first started at Canberra, which was to do something that I loved mm. every day, and I wasn't loving it. You know, I was finding it really, really hard. And this year I feel just, I feel revitalised. You know, I'm back, I'm doing my dance classes, you know, three days a week. My kids are... They love being picked up a couple of days a week. They keep asking me if they can have a babysitter on nights that I'm with them. <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. Um, you know, I think I feel like when I actually am with my kids, I'm not saying I haven't got time. Mum's just got to do this. That I'm actually really spending some quality time with them, yeah. and I just I just feel happier and um, more energized for for moving forward. I think. Yeah, and I think that's really important, Amanda, because back in the day when there was a nine-to-five job, there was a clear path. You know, these are the hours you do, and everyone has done it, so you know what the routine is. But come the world of entrepreneurship, there are no paths. Mm. You've got to create that, which is where they, that, that I guess the, uh, the hustle and bustle comes in. And then it takes time to iron the wrinkles out before you come to where you are, which is I can just breathe now and I'm, I've arrived. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, Absolutely. I mean, I was I was working in my car with my laptop for, you know, half an hour before pickup every day and it was just, it was, now I sort of think, you know what, if it doesn't happen today, I'll just do it first thing in the morning and we'll get it done. So, of course, there are still those times of overwhelm mm-hmm. for everyone, mm-hmm. but they're, they're few and far between, whereas last year I felt like I was operating on overwhelm, yeah. which, you know, it's not sustainable. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. And if you could do it all again, Amanda, I mean, as crazy as, as, as it is, are you happy with the decision to be what you're doing, what you're doing? Oh, absolutely. Look, I, as I said to you, I went back to the public service for 18 months while I built the business up. And it made me realise just how I couldn't go back to that environment full time. And that was partly because I just don't think my personality is built for a nine-to-five job. I really struggled with the having to, you know, put the armour on and do the school drop-off and get there and just work solidly for eight hours and go and do it all over again. And, you know, my I am far happier. I mean, I might be working at six in the morning, I might be working at nine at night, but in between those times, you know, I'm doing the things that make me happy. And it's the same with within my team now. I don't care if they're, you know, if they want to leave work at three o'clock to go to the gym or do whatever they want to do. I know that they're going to do their job and we far look at, you know, it's an output-based environment rather than a you need to be in the office at these hours. And, you know, it just helps with work-life balance and everyone's so much happier. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, without a doubt, especially, and that's the luxury of an entrepreneur. You work your hours. You work crazy hours, yes, but you're stimulated. You're you're fulfilled. What's your mission behind all of this, Amanda? Because yes, you wanted to do something to serve you, and now the brand has grown, the reach has grown, with more people on board. What's your mission behind propelling her camera forward even more? Look, the reason why I started it was because uh, I've always been a connector. I've always wanted to connect people and that comes out in any personality profile you care to do on me. Um, So I am actually really motivated and by seeing that happen. And, you know, we recently had our third, what we call click and connect night. And, you know, we had 65 women there, all who've struggled to make friends in Canberra. And just to see them, just to see, I guess, what, what we've done to make that happen is a huge reward for me. Um, the magazine's another really, you know, bucket list kind of thing because, as I said, I published my first one when I was 11 and to actually have a real-life magazine at 43 is pretty amazing. But, you know, it's, I look at this magazine and I see that it's, it's something that in its pages it shows just how amazing Canberra is the people in it and the city. And for me, I am, you know, hugely patriotic. 
And so if I can do something that's going to help people out there, all the Canberra haters, see just how amazing this place is, then again, that's something that, that motivates me and, and makes going to work every day worth it. Yeah, and I know you were rewarded for that recently. You were, what specific award were you given? ACT Woman of the Year. ACT Woman of the yeah. Year. And you're so deserving of that because you are. I mean, you, you do put Canberra on the map. And, Thank you. and for those of you who are around the world watching this, Canberra is a tiny city. It's the capital city of Australia, but because it's smaller than your Sydney or your Melbourne or your Brisbane, yeah, people are like a Canberra? No. no. <laughs> Yeah. But, but Amanda is the spokeswoman because she's built this community and showcases what really Canberra is all about. And, and we have a soul, you know. We're um, for those people who are listening. We mainly are a government public service city, and until recently, people haven't seen the the soul that is there. And I hope that that's what we're bringing out. Oh, that's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. I love that. There's a soul within Canberra, yeah, without a doubt. So. You're a mum at home, frustrated. You loved writing. You started. You thought, you know, why not? Just look about what's Canberra. What's, what's what's there's around. What can we do? You did a publication called it Her Canberra. You've started to monetize it. Your mission is to really bring the fruits of Canberra and the soul of Canberra to the surface so people can actually see it. What are the next steps for you? What are the next steps that you'd want to achieve now that you've got Her Canberra up and running and you're in a you know a leveled space right now more than you were previously. Look, uh, I'm not someone that has kind of five-year goals, which I'm, I'm quite gut-driven. But for me, this year is one of consolidation. We had a, a massive year last year. We, we launched, you know, the New Look website. We launched a magazine. We launched events. We launched the podcast. So this year is like, let's just keep doing what we're doing but do it even better. Um, this year I also want to... Um, get us above a sort of, I mean, we made a small profit last year, which I think is is a good thing given that we went from one staff member to five. Mm. So, but this year and beyond is looking at, all right, how can we actually really start to make a really good profit? And we also want to, um, in terms of products, I think that there's huge potential for us to leverage that Her Canberra brand into larger events um, that are really bringing the Canberra women together into events that could be business oriented, could be health and fitness, could be everything that makes us Canberra women. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's probably the next thing, but I promised my team nothing new this year. <laughs> and this might be published outside. That's okay. Thank you. <laughs> but what I find really just juicy about this, Amanda, is that you've been able to monetize a passion called writing and you've been able to monetize a passion called Canberra mm. and combine the two. Even when people were kind of hush, you know, not really interested in Canberra, you just managed to just do that and say, look, and that's the, the, the goal of whole monetize your mission is that whatever your passion is, it's doable to monetize. As long as the passion exists, you, you like you did, you find a way, you had two kids, you know, you were working 18 months part-time. You found a way to do it. And is your husband an entrepreneur? Is he well on board and supporting you along the way? He also was a public servant, but he's now, he worked as a management consultant for a few years and is now in a not-for-profit. Um, he's totally on board, supports me in whatever I do. He's the business brains as well. So when I sort of go, I don't understand this, um, <laughs> luckily he does. <laughs> But, you know, we, we each have our different strengths. And, look, and I have to say my kids are 100% behind it as well because they've been dragged around the countryside with me since they were this big. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and they now give out magazines at markets. And my nine-year-old recently said, I want to take over her camper when you die. <laughs> and I go, what happens sooner than that? Probably don't need to wait till I die. <laughs> Good to have goals. <laughs> Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> Are you looking to, I guess, steer your kids towards that role of being an entrepreneur versus? Look, I am happy with them to do whatever they want to do. I, I think that my eldest, she's very much like me personality-wise. We had school 
um, parent-teacher interviews yesterday and the comment was that she's very, very smart but she could focus more and I was like, ah. Oh, <laughs> <not> cool. <laughs> so, look, you know, I think seven and nine, they're still wanting to be, you know, princesses. So who knows what they will want to be by the time they're 17 and 19. But having, I think, you know, even in my generation, it was very much you were supposed to have really decided what you wanted to do by the time you're 12 or definitely by the time you're 15. I think my husband and I, sorry, Rita. <laughs> didn't silence that one, did I? <laughs> I think my husband and I very much want to encourage our kids to follow their passions. Um, we're already pro encouraging them to take a gap year when they finish, whereas I was straight into uni sort of thing. Mm. Um, and just because I think you need time to find out who you are and what you want to do before you decide what you want to do for the rest of your life. Yeah. I didn't find my true passion, obviously, until I was in my late 30s. I know a lot of people who don't until they're 50. Mm. So, well said. Yeah. Well said. No, absolutely. Passion takes a long time. So if... I am a mum at home and I'm watching you going, wow. What advice would you give to someone who's just in that space where you were five, six years ago at home, frustrated, going, what advice would you give to take some kind of leap and do something different or try something different? If you could talk to your old self, what advice would you give? I think you just gotta, you just got to do it. I mean, I know so many people who wait for that perfect time, you know, wait till they have all their ducks lined up. But just just start. It won't happen overnight. I mean, it, it doesn't. I mean, people say to me, my oh, goodness, her game has grown so quickly. And for me, I'm like, oh, <laughs> it's forever. Uh, and it is, it's such a slog. It really is. Mm. But, you know, you'll get to a point where you go, wow, I've actually done this. And it all starts from just making that one decision just to start. Mm. You know, you might be working part-time for a few years before it actually takes off. But if you wait until you're at that point where you can quit your day job before you start anything, it's just going to put that dream off even longer. Mm. So just take, take the first step. And, um, you know, there's, I always think of that saying, you know, feel the fear and do it anyway. Mm. And that's kind of, you know, after Sophia was born, that made me look at life a very, very different way. And I did things that, so I'd always wanted to dance from the time I was, you know, tiny. And I just had a, I had a moment after Sophia was born where I thought I didn't want to look back at the end of my life and think, God, I wish I'd done that. God, I wish I'd taken dance lessons. So I set myself a goal that I was going to learn to dance by the time I was 40. And so now I do, you know, I do samba and dance hall and zumba and this and that. And, and it makes me happy. And so, you know, that's my thing. That's the thing I try to live by. And so I try and tell my kids about is, you know, the things that are going to bring you the most reward are often the scariest. But, you know, you've got to put yourself out there. Love that. The things that are going to bring you the most rewards are often the scariest. Yeah. That's Amanda Whitley, guys. <laughs> you had that from Amanda. So... When you've got her camera, how do people find out about her camera? Those people who are listening right now, where can they go to take a look at your work, take a look at the community that you've created? Where, where do we go? Hercamera.com.au and on there, that's, that's our website. You can find your way to our various social media channels from there and you can also have a look at our at online versions of our magazine on there too. Oh, fantastic. And so if people want to, who are in Canberra or around Australia who want to come to these events, the details are there as well? Yep, we will be updating sort of events as they, as they come. Um, best to kind of follow us on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter to, to stay abreast. But, yes, anything that happens, it's on the website. Fantastic. That's hercanberra.com.au. Amanda, thank you so, so much. It's been so refreshing to talk to you, quite honestly, because A, you were a mum, you are a mum, pardon me, you were a public servant is what I was trying to say, and you've jumped into entrepreneurship. And what I love about it is you've taken something that's like Canberra and you've really given it heart, and which is why you're ACT Woman of the Year. I mean, really, because 
it speaks to who you are, it speaks to the brand and it speaks to the mission that you're here to serve, which is probably your why that keeps you in the game, the heart slogs, it keeps you in the game. So thank you so, so much for taking the time to speak to us and sharing what you're doing and I encourage everyone to go to hercamera.com.au and take a look because this is what Amanda did five years ago, an idea, and now is monetizing and look at her background, it's quite nice, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> So thank you very much and I will hopefully see you very soon at an event. Sounds lovely. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. See you guys. We'll catch you real soon.